so as I've been walking around Oxford and talking to you here, it's no, no surprise that I would be overwhelmed by the swirl of optimism for who better than the social entrepreneurs to imagine that they can make the impossible possible and then go out and do it. And yet I've also been really struck by a growing sense of wariness and weariness in so many of us who say, yes, we're seeing this interconnectedness, this global community coming together. And at the same time, we also see in our communities people pulling back into comfortable tribe and to na clinging to narrow ideology. And, and, and we're feeling this sickening gap rising between wealthy and poor. And the truth is, we're starting to ask ourselves, what will it take to keep the center whole? Will it even hold? We have no choice but to decide that it will hold and to be the ones that go forth and do it. And that's really what leadership is all about. And that is why you are in the room today. The good news is we've all been part of this journey and we will continue. My journey with Acumen started in 2001, so 12 years ago. And at the time, we had this idea, as Pamela said, that we would look at this notion that there could be a different kind of capital, patient capital, that would be backed by philanthropy and allow us to invest in entrepreneurs that would dare to go where markets had failed and aid had fallen short, and that would go on a journey with them for a long time, support them with technical assistance, and measure what we could in terms of impact, as well as financial returns. There were no road, road maps at the time, and we actually um, just decided that the best we could do was start and let the work teach us. What we did have was a compass. What we did have was a North Star direction that, at the end of the day, if we started with trying to solve problems of poverty from the perspective of poor as people who wanted to say, change their own lives, maybe we could find ways to use capital to enable entrepreneurs to serve them better. We decided to jump into the questions, go deeper and deeper. Some of those first questions were really pretty basic. Could the companies ever sustain? Would they ever scale to a point where they would even disrupt? I remember being at a meeting when I was talking about this new investment we had made in 1298, an ambulance company. And it had nine ambulances and the audacity to take on the bloated, broken bureaucracy in Indian emergency services. And after my talk, not surprisingly, I was confronted by a few businessmen who came up to me and, and explained to me that we were on a fool's errand and so was the company, that nine ambulances wouldn't even be able to serve Mumbai, which was a city of 17 million people, um, which was a good point to, for them to think about. What they didn't understand was that Shafi Mathur, Sweat and Mangal, their team, had the courage and the leadership to fight complacency and bureaucracy and corruption. And today that company has 1,000 ambulances, 5,000 employees, served 2 million people, and is now the model for how we deliver emergency services to all people, not only across South Asia, but now moving into other territories. Thank you. And as we started to succeed a little bit, the questions, of course, became deeper. And we saw that we needed more than capital in building particularly early stage companies. We were lucky to meet uh, Sam Goldman and Ned Tozen, um, who started D-Light, a solar company. And we worked with them because they had, again, the, the, the humility to see the world as it was. 1.5 billion people who had no access to electricity and were consigned to expensive, dirty kerosene, and the audacity to imagine it as it could be, that they were going to find a way to create a solar product that people valued and could afford, and they were going to change the game. It's true we invested about $2 million in equity in this company, but we also supported them with time, helping them to think through some of the critical issues at the beginning, and also six full-time Acumen Fellows over the years, working on issues like how do you price when there is no market, distribution, how do you expand effectively and geographically? And now D-Light is selling 200,000 units a month. By the end of the year, they will have brought light to 20 million people, and they are on track to bring light, solar light, to 100 million low-income people around the world by 2020. That makes a dent. You guys can't keep clapping because I'm on a time clock. <laughs> but thank you. 
Actually, I'm not going to share. There are so many successes I would love to share because I'm so proud of these guys. Um, but we also, in this journey, as I know so many of you did, hit those roadblocks where, where we were confronted with the real issues, the leadership questions of how does capital work and how do we really balance the values of accountability, yes, but also generosity. And I remember one night when we were trying to make a decision as to whether we would make a bridge loan to one of our companies that was working with 3,500 smallholder farmers buying their goods with cash when they only had 10 days left of cash on their books. So do we kill the company now because we don't think it's going to work or do we hope that it does work and know that we can at least pay these farmers and not have to make them confront the fact that there will be no tomorrow otherwise. And we decided that we were going to control capital rather than let it control us. We made the, the bridge loan. Luckily, the company is still there. Um, it's a bet. It's from a compass. And we learned a lot about failure, our own and in the sector. Um, some were easier than others. One kind of failure is um, that came from a, a time that we encouraged an entrepreneur who had a fairly good model for delivering health services to the middle class or lower middle class. And we encouraged him to try to navigate and move it down so that he could work with really low income communities. What we underestimated was what we talked about last night, the persistence, the, the understanding how hard, eye-scratchingly hard it can be. And we didn't understand that the entrepreneur did not have the kind of will that we hoped he had, and so ended up writing off that investment. The most painful kinds of failures are when we find corruption in our companies and have to exit. And we are reminded when that happens that corruption is not good for any of us, worst of all, for the poor. Sometimes failures are good, like Gro Brundtland said last night. Um, we sometimes invest in companies not knowing how early they are on the innovation curve. And in this case, it was an early stage micro health insurance company in Pakistan, the first in the country's history. And the company didn't succeed, and we had to write down part of our investment. But now there are all these other companies that are building an industry based on many of the learnings. And if we don't take the risk to fail and learn at the edge, we will not innovate in the way that we need to for the poor. So over the past 12 years, we've watched ourselves grow up and grow, and we've learned a lot. We've seen that patient capital does work, investing $85 million in 75 companies and seeing 100 million people getting access to services. It's breathtaking, almost 60,000 jobs and $400 million coming into those companies. And all around us, we've seen a whole industry burgeoning. It's frothy and it's noisy and it's thrilling. JP Morgan um, estimates that we will see a trillion dollars going into impact investing in one form or another over the next 20 years, which is heady in and of itself. My worry and the risk is that as new funds come in, people are tempted to overpromise on the kinds of outsized financial and social returns we can get simultaneously. And I don't think that's possible, and we need to have more realistic and honest conversations. So the question for me, then, is a question of leadership. And how do we continue to push ourselves to ask the questions? We started off, each of us, doing what we're doing, building tools so that we could help on this journey to end poverty. And yet, at the same time, what are the next set of questions? How do we think about the tools that we each have, and how do they interact with philanthropy, with government, with the private markets? How do we ensure that we are driven with seeing investment as a means, not as an end in and of itself? And most importantly, how do we build an economy and a society in which we measure the things that we most cherish and honor, not just the things that we can count that's our generation's challenge. And so I would say, if our first chapter, as metaphor, the skull's first 10 years was about experimentation, while we must continue that spirit of experimentation and innovation, our next chapter has to be a chapter about a new kind of leadership, a difficult kind of leadership. I dare say that leadership is harder than entrepreneurship. But if you are a social entrepreneur or in this space, 
You have to be entrepreneurial and you have to be a leader. And that is bone crushingly exhausting at times. That is the hard road. That is why it is so exciting that we have this journey to take. Together, as Chinua Achebe says, leadership is a sacred trust. We are expected to push the boundaries and to ask the hard questions. And I would say that it also requires a spiritual grounding. This courage to look inside at our own internal fears and our external resentments. This idea that we truly are connected to each other. We see it all around us every day. And that what we need from each other is this ethos, this African ethos that I am because you are, and that we move from that place. And it's really with this understanding at Acumen that so many of the decisions that we have to make and so many of the mistakes that we've made and also the successes that we have have come partially from getting the technicalities right and solving the technical problems, but mostly because we've got to be better, stronger with our judgment, with our wisdom as leaders. And so we took it upon ourselves to try to write a manifesto. We knew that it was an aspirational document, document one in which we would be pushed to be better than we think we are. And I've been carrying it around in my own pocket um, and reminded of my own shortcomings, but wanting to strive to be different. And so I thought I would share it with you, although we're not making it public to our larger community until next week. But as Jeff said last night, here at school, I'm home. We're home. And so I would just ask that you don't put it on Twitter or Facebook. Um, and when I read it, if you would indulge me, we wrote it for acumen, and at the same time, we wrote it for the kind of leadership we hope to see in the world. And I hope that it resonates with you. It starts by standing with the poor, listening to voices unheard, and recognizing potential where others see despair. It demands investing as a means, not an end, daring to go where markets have failed and aid has fallen short. It makes capital work for us, not control us. It thrives on moral imagination, the humility to see the world as it is, and the audacity to imagine the world as it could be. It's having the ambition to learn at the edge, the wisdom to admit failure, the courage to start again. It requires patience and kindness, resilience and grit, a hard-edged hope. It's leadership that rejects complacency, breaks through bureaucracy, challenges corruption, and does what's right, not what's easy. It's the radical idea of creating hope in a cynical world, changing the way the world tackles poverty, and building a, base, a world based on dignity. Thank you. Thank you. It, it all comes down to dignity. And I was lucky to be in Kenya recently, where I got to sit in this hut with a woman named Terezia Granny and David Small, the, the regional distributor of D-Light. And we were talking to her about her light. And it was easy when she was talking about what she loved about it. And then I said, well, Terezia, how would you recommend that, that D-Light improve the product? And she put her hands on her um, hips. And she said, well. And she started with um, her first suggestion, which was to make the, the battery charge while the cell phone charged simultaneously. And we thought she was done. And then she was like, and my second point is, and she moved on from that. And I was watching her talk to David and him listen to her. And I thought, this is why I started doing this work. Because what I am witnessing is a conversation between equals. She is neither pandering nor is she begging. He is not standing there with a sense of certainty nor false benevolence. They are listening to each other. And in that interaction, they have the chance to transform each other. We are each other's destiny. And it is to each of us to work on what we work on in the best way we can to bring our whole selves to it, to ask the hard questions, and to build the world where we truly can extend dignity to all people. It starts with us, and there's no better community to do it. So thank you, and Godspeed to all of you. <laughs>